right, this is the Radical Rant Podcast for June the 19th of 2019. Adam, a.k.a. CS Radical, here with you guys. Welcome to another edition. We got a lot to go through today. Uh, we got some sports-related stuff. We got some stuff going to the Xbox and PS5's price points. We have some stuff from Keanu Reeves saying that gaming doesn't need Hollywood stars. And we're going to end with what ended up being quite the backlash to news that Cyberpunk 2077 is going to have the ability to make transgender and non-binary characters. So... Let's start off with the uh, with the really topical stuff for me personally. So, outside of just being a nerd, I am a sports fan. There are so many different facets of things that I'm into. Sports is kind of like the grassroots thing that I was raised up in. Baseball was my was my main jam. Hockey as a Canadian is just kind of par for the course. And then this year has been a strange year for anybody in the greater Toronto area where I live that we finally have a major championship for the first time since the Blue Jays did it in 1993. Hell, even the first major championship in Canada since the Jays and the Montreal Canadiens in 1993. The Toronto Raptors are now NBA champions. They defeated Golden State in six, something that is unfathomable, and even to this point for me is unfathomable, even considering how beat up that Warriors lineup was. Now, I'm not the biggest basketball fan in the world. Uh, I wouldn't even call myself a Raptors fan. It just, I I fully will admit I was a bandwagoner because everybody that I knew who was a Raptors fan kept hyping me up because I knew about the Kawhi trade. Like, I keep up enough with basketball to at least be aware of what the Raptors are doing. But in terms of the actual sport, like, I know LeBron James is pretty good. And then if you talk to me about other other people in there, like, I might recognize a few names here and there. But generally speaking, I couldn't tell you you if you name a you know, the third or fourth best guy on a team, and I couldn't tell you whether they're really good or really bad, so. But I knew after uh, DeMar DeRozan was traded for Kawhi Leonard that it was a big deal. Kawhi was an NBA Finals MVP. Uh, One of the better players, as far as people are concerned, a top five player in the league at that point, regardless of whether or not he was going to be healthy after missing an entire season. So I knew. I knew it was going to be a big deal. But as a Toronto sports fan, anybody understands who is from this area knows that it doesn't matter what the hell you put in front of us. It always seems like we find a way to screw it up. You could literally put the NHL All-Star team on the ice in the Stanley Cup final for Toronto and we'd lose in four games somehow. It's that's just the voodoo wizardry and bullshit that happens to us here in Toronto, you know. We finally have gotten close in a few different ways. Obviously, the Toronto Blue Jays had two American League Championship Series appearances, never made a World Series. The Raptors before this were doing well. They had made it to a conference finals and even took LeBron James and the Cavaliers to six games. The Leafs have at least finally made the playoffs for the first time in God knows how long and have a team that on paper to us looks like a team that could win the entire champ, like could win the entire season, win the championship. And then if you want to look at other side sports, obviously the Toronto Argonauts have won a various Grey Cups. They did win the 100th Grey Cup, which was a big deal. Uh, Toronto FC obviously has won. I don't I don't know what the actual trophy is in, the M- in MLS, but they have won an MLS championship. The Toronto Marlies, which is the American Hockey League affiliate or the minor league affiliate for those who are unfamiliar with hockey. Uh, the Marlies is the minor league affiliate of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they have won a Calder Cup which is the championship in that league. We've seen various Memorial Cups go to teams in this area. We've seen, obviously, nationally, like Canada has done really well in women's soccer. Like, we've seen stuff like that. So it's not like here in Canada we're devoid of championships. But in terms of the three major sports outside of football, because we don't have a team here for, for the NFL, we have the Buffalo Bills as our closest team. And as I find here... In, in Toronto or in the GTA or even in Ontario in general, people aren't necessarily fans of the Bills just because they're closer. In fact, it's the opposite. More people are fans of various teams than they are but the one team that's closest to them. So in terms of the three teams we got, which are the Raptors, the NBA team, the Blue Jays, the Major League Baseball team, and the Toronto Maple Leafs, the NHL team, we have been devoid for basically 25 years of really any chance of success. And... 
All my friends were telling me at the beginning of the season, this could be it, this could be it. And my answer was the same every single time they said anything good about the Raptors for the entire season leading into the playoffs. Do not talk to me until they're in the finals. Otherwise, I don't care anymore because we've seen them make the playoffs and we've seen them go for a run and then blow it at the end and just come up short. And I'm so... What's the word I'm looking for? I'm... I'm I'm just assuming that it's always going to go bad. So until they get to the finals where they actually have a 50-50 split, I mean, realistically, in Vegas odds, it's not that, but if, if it's just you and another team, there is a 50-50 shot at that point that you're going to win. It doesn't matter like what the odds say. It could be 90-10 in actuality, but on paper, just by numbers, there are only two teams left, which means you have a 50% chance of winning that championship. It's either you or the other team. And that was the only way I was going to really pay attention because I don't, I'm don't. i not a big basketball guy, like I said, to begin with. So why am I going to care about what happens in the quarterfinals? Why am I going to even care what happens in the semifinals? Now, granted, the semifinal had what probably is going to be the most iconic moment of this championship run for the Raptors in Kawhi's buzzer beater to win Game 7 against the Philadelphia 76ers. But that's besides the point. But they did make the championship. And at that point, I was in. I'm like, okay, this is serious now. Because to me, any first, second, or third round match does not mean anything. Now, did I watch a couple in passing? Yes, but not of. I didn't go out of my way to go watch games. I went out of my way to go watch games in the finals. So going in, I said to anybody who is willing to listen to me that it, honestly, I would be happy if they just won one game. At least don't get swept. It's Golden State. I'm I'm not the biggest basketball guy, but I know Golden State is the Goliath of basketball right now. And maybe this might actually be it. I think depending on how the offseason goes for them, because obviously, now that, I, now that I'm paying attention to basketball, I know a little bit more. Durant is going to be out for at least a year. Now, Clay Thompson's going to be out for probably a whole year. So the team is going to be a little shorter. But Steph Curry is still arguably the best player in the NBA right now. So you still got a shot in a star-driven league like you do in the NBA. So in my head, I had no idea about the injuries also. That's again, I wasn't paying attention to basketball, so I had no idea Kevin Durant had been out this entire time. I had no idea that Klay Thompson was already dealing with injury problems. So I just figured, okay, if the Raps win one, that's a victory for me. I mean, the fact they're there already proves that at least we're capable of accomplishing something. At least we have a banner to hang in any aspect. We're either a finalist or we're going to be a champion. That's one or the other. My Obviously, my brain and heart said finalist, and I was okay with that. Then they win game one. And I'm like, okay, well, there's the win. We'll see what happens from there. And then game two happens, and I didn't watch that game. I watched the game one. Game two, I look at the score, I'm like, Oh, okay. And then I saw the 18-0 run that Golden State went on in that third quarter, and my brain just went, holy shit, they probably should have won that game. The Raptors should be up to nothing based on that, because I'm looking at all the stats at this point. Everything's pointing to the Raps being up to nothing, but they just went on an absolute slump in that third quarter. Game three rolls around. I watched that one, and it was dominant. Absolutely dominant. I watched that game in full, And I just sat there being like, they're not giving Golden State that lead ever. They did not give them back the lead at any point. And I'm thinking about it being like, they're up two to one. If they play like this the rest of the series, they're champions. There's no stopping them. Like Even if Durant comes back, if they're playing that level of dominance, they can do it. And now my head's in that age of, oh my God, could this actually be it? And the other half of my brain still sitting there being like, it's Toronto, man. Like, you know something's going to happen. Game four happens. I didn't get a chance to watch that one. I was, I was busy playing in my rec leagues. But I saw that they won. And I'm like, oh my god. They're up three to one. They have three chances to win a championship. Mathematically, that tells me they should. And that tells me they will. Because again, you look at the stats on that game, same thing as we'd seen in the previous three games. There's no, like you're thinking in your head, there's no way that for the next three games now, that team that just played dominant for four games, the team that had won, if I remember correctly, 13 of the 16 quarters in that series so far, 
that team is not just suddenly going to wither and not show up unless in colossal injuries happen. Game five. Durant is back. Durant gets hurt, and he's gone. And now the moment starts to shift. The Because cha- the Warriors were royally kicking our ass. All of a sudden... That Toronto brain kicks in again, watching Durant just knock down so many buckets and just taking control of the game and me going, oh my God, here it comes. The next three games, they're going to lose. Durant's going to get finals MVP and it's just another year of Toronto failing when they had it in the bag. Game five keeps going. We get to the fourth, they get the lead. And with three minutes left, they have a lead that should be able to close it. All they have to do is just make a couple buckets to even it out and it's over. And then they score two points the rest of the way. And Golden State wins that game. Bunch of questions. Nick Nurse calling a timeout when they got the lead. Taking the momentum away from his own team. Playing certain guys that just weren't shooting. Uh, Just a lot of decisions that didn't make any sense. Not even taking a timeout when they had a chance to, to ice the game with one bucket to win it. Not even taking the time of just letting the play run and and ended up being a shot that went nowhere. And that Toronto brain kicks in again. Even though Durant's gone and we find out Torres Achilles and is definitely gone for the rest of the series, now for the rest of the year as we know, the entire of next season for that matter. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, please, for the love of God, like it's there. They have to take it, right? They can't fail now. The one thing that was stopping them is gone. Durant's gone. Curry in game three, I remember, scored, I think, like 49 points or something in the high 40s, and they still lost. Curry can't put that team on his back. We know that now. They might get lucky for one more game, but I'm sitting there thinking, like, even if they lose game six, there's no way they can lose seven, right? But my brain's still thinking, man, just fucking win six. I don't even want to take that chance. So I'm watching game six. Because I think this is it. And they go on an early run. And then they lose the lead. And they keep not getting that lead back. It's very reminiscent of what game five was. Where they keep inching closer. And then just they can't finish. They can't close that gap. And then with five minutes left. I'm really paying attention to it again. Because I'm kind of drifting in and out. Because I'm just getting like oh my god. They're just not closing it. And then they do. Obviously, uh, Clay Thompson went out in that game as well. But regardless, you know, first championship's on the line for us. Like, I don't care if every Golden State Warrior player goes down and we just have to win by default. Like, I would take any championship at this point because, I mean, I, I don't... I'm old enough to remember the 93 World Series win, but I'm not old enough to really remember how, how to feel about it. I think it was five or six. I remember the highlight of Joe Carter hitting that home run, but I mean, I was too young to really understand what it meant. This time I knew what it meant. And I'm sitting there watching the game as it keeps going, thinking, please, like this, this has to be it, right? It can't not be. And then they get to take the lead. And we get closer and closer to the end. And they do it. I mean, it took fucking like 10 minutes even though we knew it was over, but they did it. And I got to tell you, I thought I was going to feel so much better about it. But unfortunately, there's a lot of problems that came with this championship. There's the constant side that people are taking where they're already trying to take shots at us because they're thinking, well, you only beat a, you beat a Golden State team that wasn't, you know, that wasn't that even remotely close to their full strength. It's the playoffs, first of all. Everybody is not at full strength. Everybody's banged up. Sure, Warriors had a few more banged up guys, but it is what it is. People are still hurting. Fred Van Vliet was walking around with a friggin' missing tooth and, and probably like either a broken cheekbone or damn near close. Giant cut under his eye. Guys are working with bad knees. They're just hanging in there. Everybody's hurting. But on top of that, what's killing me the most about this championship, and I don't know how everybody else who enjoyed it felt, but as a guy who is used to watching hockey and baseball, 
World Series championships being won, Stanley Cups being won. I notice that there is a moment that comes with that win. When you win in baseball, there's an out or it's a game-winning hit. In hockey, there's always that countdown and it goes. It's so rare that in hockey, for what happened in that Raptors game to happen, for that many timeouts, for that much pausing, the Raptors technically won that championship three separate times. So the moment is no longer going to be you know, as memorable as, say, Kawhi's Game 7 winning shot against Philly. That will probably be... Actually, no, I wouldn't even say probably. That will be the most memorable moment of this Raptors championship run. It's not going to be them winning the championship. It's going to be Kawhi hitting that shot. Because the championship itself took 12 minutes. It took forever to happen. Which is my biggest complaint with basketball is I don't get all the timeouts. I don't get all the pausing. It's, it's the same reason why I have problems with, with football. Just all the breaks. At least with baseball, yeah, there's breaks, but it's because every time you have to throw the ball, that's when play happens. Football, it's literally a consistent run of five-second plays and then two-minute breaks. And in so many of those plays, nothing happens. At the very least in baseball, a strike is made, a good pitch can be made, a foul ball that could be really close to being a hit could be made. Or at any time, obviously, a hit can be made. A strikeout can happen. What what really happens in football if a play doesn't go anywhere? It's just, it's nothing. It's literally nothing. It doesn't work towards anything. An incomplete pass does not accomplish anything. And in basketball, with all these timeouts, it makes a moment like a championship win diminish. Because as they won that championship, the relief of no longer having to say Toronto is not a championship city is gone. But I don't feel like it's, it's that memorable right off the bat. And then on top of that, the way the championship is hoisted and the way the ceremony was done was terrible. Adam Silver is not a great talker, so it already kind of sucked to begin with. Um, I don't like the fact that the owners are the first people to hoist up that trophy. I don't care that the owners are the ones that sign the paychecks and without them, there's no team. Unfortunately, without the players that actually played the fucking game, there's no championship. Kawhi Leonard and Kyle Lowry should be the first two people hoisting that damn trophy. So I'm already mad because of that too. And then Doris Day is going around interviewing people like Marcus Gasol asking what's he got to say to his Grizzly teammates that he left for this championship team. Who gives a shit about what happened on a different team. This is about this run. This is about this moment. Tell, ask Marc Gasol how it feels to be a champion. To ask him how it feels to come to a country like Canada and win their first championship in Toronto. Ask them those questions. Who gives a shit about the rest of that stuff? And that ruined it as well. So for me, an outside basketball watcher, not even a fan... I finally get to see a championship in my home country, and I don't even care now. It hasn't sunk in because to me it doesn't matter anymore. Because every chance to make that moment great was taken away. And unfortunately for people that went to the parade on Monday, they unfortunately had to deal with some serious problems like people firing fucking guns in the crowd. So even the parade, which by the way took five hours instead of the planned two and a half, and then the speeches were basically reduced to nothing, it didn't feel like a celebration to me. But again, this could just be because I'm not a diehard. But as somebody on the outside looking in, and these are the people you want to convert, I left thinking, well, I guess I'm done watching basketball again for a long time, because now they've got their one championship. I don't care now. Now I'm back to waiting for the Leafs to possibly win a Stanley Cup in these next five years when they have all these guys like Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, well, hopefully Mitch Marner, I should say, Morgan Riley, uh, and various other guys in the Leafs. Oh, John Tavares, of course. You got all these guys that, on paper, you have a team that should be able to win one, or at least has a damn good shot at winning one. So I'm waiting for that. 
And now we got this Blues Jays team that is just starting to get its young guns coming. Obviously, Vladdy Jr.'s up there. Kevon Biggio's up there. Bo Bichette's on his way. You got guys like Sean Reed Foley waiting in the wings that are get, waiting to get their chance to pitch. There's so much coming up that who knows what will happen in the next three to five years. But now the Raptors have a championship. And don't get me wrong by all the comments I've made. I am still very happy about it because at the very least, we have something to celebrate. Obviously, with the 2 million estimated people that went to that parade, it meant a lot. And it does. To the city and to this country, it means a lot that the Raptors won this championship. It's just to an outside fan like me who was so open. If you had seen how I was reacting in Game 5, how crushed I was that they lost that game, you would have taken any sort of bet that after Game 6 was over and they won, I would have been head over heels being like, I'm a fucking fan now. And instead, my apathy towards basketball is exactly what it was when I left. Because then we move over to the St. Louis Blues who won the cup the night before. The night before the Raptors, I should say, not the night before uh, this podcast. The St. Louis Blues win the cup. There is a countdown and you can see them celebrating and they're ready to go and they're all jacked up and done and they get on the ice, they do their huddles up and cheers and whatever. They quickly go with the handshakes with the Bruins, and then the trophy goes right away. Batman comes out to the cascade of booze he always gets, presents the, con- the consmice to Ryan O'Reilly, and then we get the Stanley Cup. And we get a bunch of fuck yeahs and a bunch of cheering and excitement, and these guys look super happy. And I didn't feel that way watching the Raptors as much. Now, I'm not saying the players weren't happy, but I think it took so long to get to that point. And also just the idea that they're, they're being stopped right on the stage when they're trying to get a chance to hold this trophy to be asked questions that make no fucking sense at this time. And you have owners sitting there trying to get a hoist of that trophy because, my God, I wrote your paycheck and you I should get it before you because fuck you. There's all this stuff behind it. Whereas... I remember last year's Stanley Cup win with the Washington Capitals, for example. That will forever be, at least, unless somebody can somehow top this, but I don't know what story, unless the Leafs win, of course, I should say. Ovechkin hoisting that cup may be my favorite sports moment today. That even counts the Carter home run, because again, I was too young. In terms of something that I actually watched and was able to understand, the Ovechkin cup hoisting was such a great moment because he waited so goddamn long and went through so many teams that on paper should have floored the competition and won that trophy. And he finally gets it. And my God, you can feel the emotion. You can feel how much that meant to him. You can understand how much that meant to him. Everything about that moment is memorable. Him getting excited even before he got to hoist the damn thing. And then the second he gets his hands on it, you can see and feel the wave of emotion and the monkey coming off his back and all that weight off his shoulders because he finally got it. And the music choice when they hoisted it was so good. Everything about it was so good. And then when the Raptors hoisted it, it felt like a fart in church to me. And remember, I'm not a Washington Capitals fan. So it's not like this is a homerism thing or it's not like, you know, oh, well, you didn't care about the Raptors championship because you're not, a, you're not a big basketball fan. No, it's this is my home team winning a championship and I cared less about it than the guy that is from a team that's not even in the same country that I'm in. But the reason is because the two had the same thing. You understood how much this meant, but one moment was done so much better in terms of how it was shot, how it was delivered. And in this case, it was terrible. And same with the Blues. Like, you understood, because it was 52 years that team has been around and never won one. So you see guys like Brett Hall being so goddamn happy to see the team that he played for for so long finally get one. Sure, he got one in Dallas. But the Blues is like his home from home. So it was such a cool moment. And congrats to the Blues for doing it, especially because you got to take out the Boston Bruins, who, as any Leaf fan will tell you, is almost as good as seeing the Raptors win the trophy. So, uh, so what did I spend like over half an hour on sports? I think here, what was the time split? 24 and a half minutes. Holy crap. <laughs> I guess I got pretty intense on that one. So I guess let's get back into gaming stuff. Cause, uh, I, I don't want to talk, uh, 
an entire show about about a sport that I don't care about right now and a team that I don't, I'm not even a fan of. I was just happy to see because they beat the team I can't stand. So industry experts are starting to kind of give their estimates on what the, the console pricing is going to be again. It's the 10,000th time. But I never had a chance to really talk about it on this podcast, so I figured this would be a great moment to do it. And his estimate is that he thinks that the console itself is probably going to be worth 500 bucks, but they're probably going to sell it at 399 Which to me, and obviously US, that means here it, it would be about 550 for us because the dollar is absolutely horrendous. I'm hoping that it doesn't end up turning into a 549.99 console and they somehow be like, oh, it's 499 for you guys in, in, in Canada land, which I'd be like, sweet. But I doubt I wouldn't get that lucky. Um... If that's the pricing, then that's exactly where it, where it needs to be. Now, I'm in, I've been asked the question, too, if it was actually $499 US, would you still pay for it? And I said yes, but I would be a little more hesitant to get it sooner than later. If it was $399, I would get it after that first initial run where they kind of get rid of some of the bugs with it and, the, and they kind of figure stuff out. Because I can play on a PlayStation 4 no prop for another six months to a year if I have to. That isn't an issue. But if it's $499... That's when we get into the territory of, all right, I'm waiting for a Black Friday sale or I'm waiting for some indistinguishable package where it's like, okay, it's still a $4.99 console, but it comes with these two games that I really want to play. Then you got my attention. But at $4.99, it's not quite where I'd be to just hit that trigger immediately. $3.99, yeah, I'm setting up for six months from launch, maybe a little bit after, if depending on how, um, how busy that area of time is. Like if it comes out in the fall, Maybe wait until spring is a pretty good idea because that's right around that time that you know people are starting to go back to school. Like winter's over now, so nobody, not everybody's, you know, hold up at home, and that's a good time to at least get the console when you might see some better deals coming. Up. But in terms of price, like I don't have a problem with either or. Now, if we get over five hundred dollars US, that's when we get into an issue because it, that that's when the argument of well, couldn't you just get a PC comes up? That's that's when it truly does come up. I don't like the argument of people being like, well, console's dead, you should just get PC. I don't like that that comment because, again, a lot of PC gamers, and I have friends that I, that I talk to about this where I say the exact same thing, people really underestimate how important it is for some people to just be able to take something out of the damn box and just plug it in and plug it into their TV and it's done. And cost, obviously being a little bit cheaper helps too, but realistically, it's just the idea, like I have a really nice laptop that I've had for five years now but it was $3,000 because I got it initially to uh, to go into audio editing for um, music studios. That was the initial plan when I got this laptop and then things changed on that front. So now I just have a really good laptop that has stayed with me for five years and hopefully stays for another five. Um, but I could never, just on a whim, just get a PC and then keep upgrading as time goes along. I, I, don't, I don't like the hassle of that. It's so much nicer and this is why I play consoles, is because I can just go to the store, be like, I want that, take it home, take it out of the box, plug that son of a bitch in, and wait, for, maybe do a software update, and boom, I'm done, and I can play whatever the hell I feel like. It's fine. Whereas with PC, there's all this other rigmarole to go around. I got all these options set around half the time, especially with operating systems. You got to mess around with things to kind of customize it to where you like it. It, it. it ends up being more of a hassle. Now, sure, is it a first world problem? Of course it is. But we have the ability to make that personal preference, and that's why I would rather do it. So, consoles are supposed to be cheap. So, I would prefer that when we get our next generation, that there is a $400 model. Now, this doesn't mean there's no possibility of, say, the the $700 model. Like, you can go six, seven hundred bucks, be like, this is the big fucker. This is the one that's going to blow you away. Sure. If you want to do that too, go right ahead. Have the more expensive one like the Xbox One X and the PS and the PS4 Pro is. Do it. Don't care. Just make sure that there's an affordable option because again, there is still a large market that is not interested in paying up the ass just to play a couple of games. Just let's 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 be fair about that. And then the last two things I want to talk about are both related to Cyberpunk in a way. Uh, the first one is that Keanu Reeves made a comment in a, I don't know if it was initially a PC Gamer review. No, it was, sorry, it was a post E3 interview with the BBC. It's PC Gamer that I saw this article from. Um, where he basically said in, in you know, to, to shorten it up, that he doesn't think that video games necessarily need Hollywood stars to, to make them important or to make them uh, legitimate. 
in, in a way. So this is kind of the the quote directly from it, where he says, I don't think video games need legitimizing. If anything, I'd say it's gone the other way. It's more of the influence gaming's had on, let's call it Hollywood. Certainly with the Marvel Universe, right? But then gaming probably started in the beginning with Hollywood, right? I think these technologies have been talking to each other. I mean, Marlon Brando in the first Superman. I remember him saying, okay, so now they can just digitize how I am, my look, and do another performance, and I don't need to be there. That idea of the technology of image capture and performance, we're seeing in Hollywood now so many performers where they're either aging or making other performers younger. The elasticity of performance and time and what you look like and who you are, it's getting more complex. So realistically, I mean, the core thing he says right at the beginning, I don't think video games need legitimizing. And that's the core of it. Obviously, we have a lot of popular video game voice actors that we have out there. You have your Nolan Norse and your Troy Bakers and your Jennifer Hales and, and various actors of that ilk. Now, to say that Keanu Reeves being in Cyberpunk, for example, is not a crazy amazing thing, that's, that's different. But Keanu Reeves in Cyberpunk or not in Cyberpunk doesn't change the fact that Cyberpunk is one of the most hyped up games right now and will probably be one of the best selling games when it comes out. Keanu Reeves being in the game maybe only sells it to a couple people. Now, if I'm talking a couple, I'm talking hundreds, but I'm not, we're not talking like all of a sudden there's going to be an extra 100,000 game copy sold just because Keanu Reeves is in it. No, because generally speaking, the people that already are aware of Cyberpunk are either, have already made up their mind whether they're playing this game or not. But the question still lies, do we need Hollywood stars in, them to, in our games to legitimize them? And the answer, I fully agree with Keanu Reeves, is no. Is it something that makes games better? It could, but we've also seen that it, it works in opposite ways. I'm a big Destiny guy, and Peter Dinklage did not do anything to help Destiny. Nolan North comes in, and it's a lot better. And Nolan North is just your, you know, your run-of-the-mill voice actor that we're so used to in either cartoons or, or video games and the like. It's, it's like, you can't just necessarily be like, well, here's Leonardo DiCaprio in this game. It's not automatically going to make it good. In fact, a lot of the time, you find that when Hollywood actors are used in games, they are usually put there to hide the fact that they actually haven't made that great a game. They're trying to sell you it by saying, well, here's this really popular guy in it. They did that to us in video game films, for God's sakes. They got Michael Fassbender in for Assassin's Creed, and we thought, well, fuck, Michael Fassbender's a damn good actor. This has got to be the good one, right? Turns out it's not. You know, Detective Pikachu, it took Detective Pikachu and Ryan Reynolds, for God's sakes, for us to actually believe that they were putting effort in because Ryan Reynolds took a series a comic series that basically every film studio had nothing to want to do with and took it and made it into a fucking gem. And then he goes into Detective Pikachu and we're thinking, look, I don't know how I feel about this, a real, a live action Pokemon movie, but fuck Ryan Reynolds is in it. And that guy goes into things and he turns it into gold. It's not like he's there and it's just, okay, it's good quality. No, when Ryan Reynolds is in something right now, you know it's going to be good because he's putting his goddamn, all, all of his, his love for whatever he's doing into it. I mean, obviously with Detective Pikachu, it helped as well that it actually looked good. Unlike a lot of video game movies, a Sonic the Hedgehog before they decide to make changes. Same deal, you know, it's, we're so used to these things just looking terrible. And when things look terrible or when things are programmed terrible in terms of games, what do they do? They try to slap somebody under the cover of it to just make you think, oh, that's so cool that this guy's in it. Or in the, I, I think, honestly, there are a lot of games out there that were never planned to take on a license, but they were done terribly and were going to be released as a, as a fresh new IP. And when the company knew that they were, that whatever team was working on this thing was putting out a crap game, they figure, well, fuck, let's throw on a popular license onto it so at least we can sell some copies and maybe make our money back. There's no way that that's not been happening for a long time now. So for a license to legitimize a game, the same goes the opposite way. An actor is not going to be legitimizing a game anytime soon. It doesn't change anything. It just puts more into the marketing department's back pocket. 
Because like I said, like when I saw Cyberpunk's initial trailer, I was already in. For them to put Keanu Reeves in it is like dessert at this point. It makes me friggin' happy, and it's gonna be not, it's gonna be sweet, pun intended. But it wasn't necessary. I didn't need dessert. And given the track record, also this is the other thing too. If Bioware just suddenly comes up and be like, "Here's a new Mass Effect game," and uh, let's see who who would be an interesting person to throw in there. Um, let's say they just put Matt Damon in there. Like it's just I'm I'm trying was trying to think of a better name, but let's just say Matt Damon. Actually, fuck it. Let's go let's go down the the Avengers route. Let's say they throw in Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Evans. Like just insert any of the, any of the core Avengers in there. And we'd be like, holy shit, that's a big deal. That guy in a Mass Effect game? But with the history the Bioware has, would we trust that? No. Why do we trust CD Projekt Red? Because they've made arguably one of the better RPGs this year series that we've seen in quite some time. And when we saw the initial trailer for Cyberpunk 2077, the gameplay trailer especially, we looked at it and said, wow, they've put the work in. So for them to be like, oh, Keanu Reeves is also going to be in this game too. And we're like, okay, that's fucking cool too. Not it's that's fucking cool. It's that's fucking cool too. That's the important part. A Hollywood actor being in a game is meant to compliment. And if they're using it as a selling point, that's when you have to raise the red flag. And one last thing we're going to talk about cyberpunk, like I said, at the top of the show. So they came out and said that the character customization will allow for the inclusion of the creation of transgender and non-binary characters in the game. And naturally, people were upset about it. Because it's the internet. Everybody's upset about things. Now, I know if you have gone back and looked through my channel, if you've gone back and looked through things I've said on my blog, I have been for a number of years, for a a good period of time, still sort of am, uh, I've been an anti, anti-SJW, and we obviously know that SJW is one of their biggest things to target is transgender, is the LGBTQ community. This is a case, though, where I think I need to put my flag down, really plant it dead center in where I am so that people understand where I'm really standing on this. Because there are people that I know that will watch this that have known me for a while and be like, really? Like, you've been always fighting against this kind of stuff. There's a difference on what's going on here than the things that I've I've criticized in the past. This specific case, because again, I look at everything through a case-by-case basis. Cyberpunk, including the creation of transgender and non-binary characters in their game for the main character that you play as, is not a decision that was made to be only transgender and non-binary characters. This was not a decision that was made after a shit ton of people screaming for it. Because, as we've seen before, CD Projekt Red doesn't give a fuck about what people say about them. This is a point where this was a decision made because they want to include everybody. And if you think that inclusion is a bad thing, I, I don't know what I can say to you that will help you change your mind. Now, you can, we can debate the whole non-binary stuff. Because I get it, and I am a little weirded out by how people are just essentially, like, and I'm not trying to be an asshole by saying this, but it really does feel like people are just making up new genders so they can identify themselves as something. But in terms of trans, this is not something that just doesn't exist. This isn't something that is like an imaginary thing. These are real people. And the non-binary thing... I I fought in the beginning, but only because I felt that it was being shoved down our throat and we were being expected to just automatically change to it. And if we didn't, it was an issue. And this is where things come in. If somebody came out and wrote an article and did a massive hit piece on CD Projekt Red because they didn't have the inclusion of transgender and non-binary characters, I would also take umbrage with that. Because as I've said so many times before, and I will continue to say it on this show, if I ever start writing blogs again, in other videos that I make on this channel, and in other places that I'm on, whether I do podcasts for other places, do articles for other places, do videos in other places, do audio in other places, or even if I speak in public, I will say this every single time. In the age that we are in, 
in this age of video games and anime and cartoons and films and television and all these fictional pieces of media, and this is the word that's so important here, fictional, everything is fair game into the choice of the person creating that piece of fiction. If that person is making a video game, let's just stick to games here. If that person is making a video game and they are making it so that is a sole male character as the main character, that is their choice to do. So Feminist Frequency and all these people that were writing about last year and now this year about how many games were sole female protagonists compared to sole male protagonists, that number is inconsequential because not to mention that over half of the games this year give you the option to choose which gender you want to play as. But at the end of the day, even if the number was a 1% to 99, it does not matter. It's fiction. This isn't reminiscent of real life. If these games are being made to all be modern, then you can maybe have a case. But so many of these games are future, past, alternate dimension, completely not even having anything to do with the human race. If somebody wants to make their game as a male-inclusive game, like just their, their character is only male and there's no other thing, that is fine. If someone wants to make a game that is just a woman, that is fine. If someone wants to make a game where it's just a gay black man, that's fine. If somebody wants to make a game where it's just a transgendered person in this game, that is fine. That's their choice. The second that anybody on either side of the debate says, no, you can't do that. That's bullshit. Fuck you. If you are the person that's getting mad at certain games saying, why is that person not, like, how, what, what's, is that person gay? Why is that person not gay? You're an idiot. And if you're the opposite side, like in this case with Cyberpunk saying, why the hell are they putting transgender people? And they're like, oh my God, you're just pleasing the SJWs. Shut the fuck up. They made the choice to do this. And it's not hurting anybody to include this stuff. You don't have to make that character. And it's in here. It's in that game now. And it's not going away. That was their choice. Respect that choice. Because if the game is good, who gives a shit what the character is? For God's sakes, like everybody makes the argument, like the SJW argument of females not being main characters in games. Because they make it sound like it's a male-dominated thing. Well, if that was the case, I don't remember as a kid knowing anybody that played Metroid and got mad when they found out Samus was, or Samus was a woman. I don't remember that. Nobody's still saying that to this day. Nobody's upset that Metroid has never had a male person in that armor. As far as I know, I've never seen that article. I would love if somebody had seen one to post that to me, but I guarantee you it's not been done by anybody who has any credibility. Not that game journalists have a lot of credibility these days, but I digress. I don't think I've seen people make that case. In the same case that I've never seen anybody write an article saying, man, why isn't Link like this more muscular, like manly man, like lumberjack fucking quality guy? He's always been a very feminine looking boy, hasn't he? In fact, when I saw the one article being like, why can't Link be a girl? I'm like, well, if, you wa if you've watched Breath of the Wild, it looks pretty damn close, doesn't it? In the end, like, this is a fight that I used to fight a lot and now I just can't be bothered to care anymore. It's, why do we care what the characters are in the game? If the story is good, if the gameplay is amazing, if the music choices are fantastic, if the game looks phenomenal, if all these other pieces are so good, the person behind the character shouldn't make a goddamn difference at that point. I had the opportunity a long time ago when Mass Effect first came out to really open my mind on these things because it was very rare that I got to play games where I create a character and a lot of the time when I did I would always create something that would look as close to myself as I could now when we had games like Mass Effect where things were getting a lot better graphically I had the chance to do something that I normally wouldn't do and that was create characters that were beyond what I was normally in my comfort zone on and I did that I played my first run of Mass Effect as your regular male shepherd and I got about halfway into the game, and I just found myself just bored of them. I still finished it. But then I went back. When Mass Effect 2 came out, I was playing as Male Shepard again and just couldn't find myself. So I went back to the original. Because I wanted, just for the curiosity's sake, seeing what it would be like playing as Fem Shep. 
Actually, sorry, I tell a lie. It was Mass Effect 3 that I ended up going back. I played Mail Shap all the way through 1 and 2. But 3 is when I, I started being like, man, like I'm, I think I'm kind of done with this. The story was still fine. But I just the character wasn't doing it. So you know what? I went back, played the original 2 as Fem Shep. And I don't know why the hell I never thought about doing that sooner. Because Fem Shep is a hell of a lot better than, than Male Shep ever was. And I finished the entire trilogy as Fem Shep. And played two more runs of that game over the course of time up until this point as Fem Shep again. The entire way through the, those three games. Yes, that includes that shit ending. In most games now, I will actually play as a woman. For two reasons. One, because it's amazing in a piece of fiction to play as something you're not. And if I want to play as something I'm not, what better way to play than as a gender I'm not? And up until a few years ago when I really became aware of my bisexuality, I was always playing as a lesbian woman. Because it was the polar opposite. Now, granted, there's a little 10% in there being like, well, especially in Mass Effect's case, if I'm going to stare at somebody's ass for the entire game, I might as well stare at an ass I'm attracted to. Now that I'm bi, it doesn't make a difference. But, <laughs> pun intended, it was mostly just because I wanted to do something different. And when I play Cyberpunk, there's a very good chance that I will play as a transgendered woman. Very good chance of that. I'm not sure yet. Depends on how everything looks. If I find something that I just end up liking before I get to that point, who knows? Maybe that's what I go with. But in a game like Cyberpunk, where I have an option that I normally don't get, there's a very good chance I take that option. And I think that's amazing. And we're not even talking about how amazing that is for people who are transgender, for people who identify as non-binary. Whether or not I agree with some of those genders that fall into that category. That's a whole different conversation. But at this point in time, if you are a player that looks at that and says, that's something like me, I can finally play as myself in this game, why is that not a good thing? I've had the ability for so long to be able to already do that as a guy. And now I've had the chance to be able to play as the polar opposite. Whether that's in more realistic games like a Mass Effect where I have to play as a very I mean, you can always make stupid looking characters in Mass Effect, but this isn't like Saints Row, for God's sakes. I can do it all the way down. You know, I can make my really serious looking, dark skinned, silver haired woman who is going to be all kinds of badass and we can't wait to fuck every space alien that she can find. But then you go to Saints Row and then you just make the most ridiculous freaking blue skin thing that you can find, too. That's the beauty of being able to create your characters. It's why I love games that do that. Granted, there are a lot of games out there that don't and are still really well-told stories because they have one character to write for. But in games where we have the option to create whatever we want, why would I ever be upset with the idea of giving us more options? I want more sliders. I want to be able to customize as much as I possibly can if I could customize their entire personality, their backstories, their hometowns, the things they enjoy, I would do that. That's why I love it. Like, this is the thing. I've played The Sims 3 and 4 a lot. But a lot of it had nothing to do with playing the actual game itself. I just enjoyed creating people and creating houses. Because it was that beauty of just letting that creative juice flow. And the idea that anybody would attack cyberpunk because they're offering more options. I don't even want to go to down the transphobic route because it's not even it's not even worth going after at this point because the core of this is that people are denying choice in their games. That to me as a gamer is a bigger crime than even transphobia would be because you're basically saying to a company, "I don't want you to give me more options. I don't want you to allow me the freedom to do whatever I feel like doing. Why don't we just go back to the days of Pong then, where we only can play as one object, play one kind of game. Why don't we go back to that? Oh wait, that's right, because it's dull and boring. When I plug in Cyberpunk, the day it comes out, because make no mistake, I'm playing that game day one. 
I will probably spend about an hour in that character creator fighting over what I want to do for this first character. From the skin color, to the hair color, to the hairstyle, to the eye color, to the body frame, to the amount of abs I can count on that, to, since it's probably going to be female in one way or another, to the size of the breasts if that's an option, to her sexuality, to her backstory if that's an option, to her voice if I can choose what her voice sounds like. Every little detail I can go after, I will do that. And that in itself is what makes games today as amazing as they've been and better than they've ever been. Because we today have more choice in our games than we ever have had before. And Cyberpunk, to my knowledge, is the first major game that I've seen that really gives us that chance. I know Sims later adopted the ability to do transgender, but this is, this is big. This is a big game to do this. If, if bigger, if, if other massive games have done this example, I'd love to hear that in the comments below. But this is the first to my knowledge. Because it may just be a game that I've missed along the way. It's very possible. But for in my eyes right now, this is the big one. This is the first big one that does. And I'm so excited and I'm so happy for a lot of people out there that finally get a chance to be able to really enjoy that. Granted, some journalists are still taking shots at it because, oh, they're doing things that seem somewhat racist in the game. Like, well, it's fucking 60 years in the future, so God only knows what it's like. I mean, thanks for assuming what you think the future is going to look like. So, you know, have your keep your opinion to yourself on that one because I don't really care what the game is doing because all I know is that I'm going to have a goddamn blast playing that game as Keanu Reeves is my sidekick, hopefully, and we're going to go fuck shit up. And whether I am a, a straight, cis, white male with a shitty haircut, like like a lot of those characters end up looking at... The default character always looks so bad, I swear to God. It's almost on purpose. Whether I go with the most generic fucking white dude or a sassy, like Han Solo speaking, black woman with silver hair, maybe even transgendered, I will... One way or another, I'm going to enjoy that game. But I will have done it with the choices that I decided that I was going to go with on that character. And anyone who thinks that that's a bad idea needs to revoke that gamer card that they are so desperately clinging on to right now. So with that being said, guys, that's going to do it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this stuff. Don't forget to share this too to whoever you know that would give a shit about this kind of stuff. And, uh, hopefully, uh, this week goes by quick because there's a lot of stuff I don't want to do this week and, uh, I want to kind of get to next week as soon as we can. Not to mention, I just want to get to March and April as soon as we can because Lord knows there's a crap ton of games I want to play that are coming out. Man, oh man, March and April is going to be a nightmare. I already went through that in E3, so I'm not going to repeat myself too many times. As always, guys, thanks for watching or listening, depending on what you did. And you know what? You know what's coming. I'll see you next time.